Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Today, guest of honor, one of the most important men in comics history, mm -hmm. certainly in our lifetimes, uh, responsible for the start of dozens of our friends' careers, the great Peter Laird, co-creator of the Ninja Turtles. But why don't you drop some more of that uh, history, that bibliography? I'll tell you the truth, man. You already did. Teenage <laughs> Mutant Ninja Turtles co-creator. One of the other things that's really huge, uh, you mentioned starting a lot of our peers' careers, founder of the Zerich Foundation, yeah. which... If that was the only thing you did, it would be massive. But between that and co-creating the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, we've got a lot to talk about here, Ed. Yes, we do, man. And you can't have the Zurich Foundation if you don't got some some money to put in a kitty for that thing. So like, we should try to get the lead up to all that. Peter, thank you so much for, for joining us here today on Cartoonist Kayfabe. Sure thing. Before Ninja Turtles, man, you, like, you sent us a couple of really cool items that you have put together uh, pre night pre Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm. Calendar of the Gods, and uh, this barbar barbaric fantasy comic. Mm -hmm. Definitely wearing a little of that BWS on on your sleeves, man. The gor <laughs> the gor blimey press stuff was happening, yeah, for sure. When you take a look at these calendars, we'll do independent episodes showing these pieces off. But uh, you were already up and running before uh, Ninja Turtles. So, like, what kind of illustration gigs would you get? to uh, subsidize your living or whatever? Well, it actually started when I graduated from college. Uh, very shortly after that, probably within a month, I got a gig doing, drawing a campus map for Amherst College, which was nearby. And that actually was, uh, it, it actually allowed me to buy my first stereo system, <laughs> uh, which I remember very fondly um, back in the days of vinyl. Um, but I, I, I to, the calendar, the the uh, the map was a big fold-out thing, probably like 17 by 22 or something like that. Um, and I had to study the campus to see where all the trees were and the, every building, and it was it was kind of an involved thing. I think it probably took me about a month to draw it. Um, but I ended up getting paid, I think, 185 dollars for that. Um, Actually, this is something I just remembered. It doesn't have really anything to do with my career as an illustrator, but I had uh, the previous year <laughs> built my own Star Wars Stormtrooper uniform out of paper mache and, and lingerie boxes. <laughs> uh, and I used the lingerie boxes because I had at the time a job doing janitorial stuff at a lingerie store. A woman's clothing store, actually. But they threw away a lot of stuff, a lot of packaging material. And one of the, the things they threw away was the, were these boxes that uh, lingerie came in. And they were, they were perfect for building the Stormtrooper off because they were pretty durable. And they, they had nice flexibility. Um, and I built the whole thing except for the helmet, which I actually bought from an outfit that was selling them out of California, and the shoes. I, I bought some like white tennis shoes. And oh, and the gun, the Stormtrooper blaster, I bought that at a toy store. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that there was a, uh, a guy on campus, a campus photographer who had a, a, an archive of photographs of the campus that I was able to use um, as reference for this, this map I was drawing. And it turned out that, that um, the, the guy that I was, that I was dealing with uh, uh, at Amherst College was willing to walk around the campus with me and taking photos of me in my Stormtrooper costume, <laughs> posing in different ways around the campus, which was a lot of fun. I still have those somewhere, so those photographs somewhere. I, I need to see those yes, photos. Everybody <laughs> needs to see those. It should have been published in, in the in the in the pages of TMNT, those editorial pages or something, man. That would be amazing. It brings up a good point, Peter. Where where do you uh, wear your Star Wars cosplay at that time? <laughs> I actually did wear it out a couple of times. One time at a, a, a dance that was being held at uh, Smith College, which is another college in our area. Um, my wife yeah. has a degree from from Smith. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. All world. It's a great school. Um, but they, I, I knew some people who were going to this dance, and it was like a Halloween dance kind of thing. And um, I, I'm generally pretty shy about stuff like that. But because I was completely covered in this stormtrooper armor, 
uh, and nobody could see my face. I, I felt pretty good about it. And it was fun. I, although I have to say that it was a it was a warm day, and moving around in the stormtrooper outfit made me sweat a lot. <laughs> and uh, ended up wrecking it uh, to some degree. I think I, I patched it together again, went out to another party sometime later, but that was the one that I remember the most. Part of the reason I ask, you know, where you would wear that is, what is the, like, the comic scene like? You know, we, Ed held up a couple of your self-published efforts from, from early on. Was there a comic scene? Like, what? how were you participating in, in that? Um... It, it was it was not quite as robust as it turned out to be during the years that Kevin and I had Mirage Studios and he had Tundra and he had the, the Awards and Pictures Museum in, in the Northampton uh, downtown. Um, but there was comic, comic stuff happening. In fact, the, one of the things that brought Kevin and I together, and you, you may have already heard this story, um, I, went along with some other cartoonists that I had met in the Northampton area, um, put together a, a comic magazine called SCAP. And it was a free magazine. And uh, we basically um, went around to local businesses in the area and got them to buy ad space in the, in the back of the magazine, which, w which meant that we could print this magazine with our work in it and not, not have to pay for it with you know, the ads, the ads paid for that. And uh, I was with the, that, out, that group of people for probably, I don't know, maybe a year. And then we had some disagreements and I left. Um, but Kevin, when he was, had moved down to the, um, the area before we knew each other, he was taking the bus between Northampton and Amherst and found a copy of SCAT on the floor of the bus. And of course, that, that interested him a lot because he was, you know, an up, up and coming cartoonist and uh, really wanted to see his work in print. And he went to the SCAT offices in Northampton. And as it turned out, they didn't really um, like his stuff enough to publish it. Um, they had other, other types of things they wanted to do. But they gave him my name and my, my number. And uh, Actually, I think not, not my number, but my address. And he wrote me a really nice letter. I got it, you know, kind of out of the blue. It's, you know, here's this nice person writing me this nice letter. And I invited him to come over. And uh, as they say, the, I think the story, the story had been told a lot where he, the, one of the first things he saw when he came in my apartment was an original Jack Kirby pencil losers page uh, that, that I had purchased some time before that. And that really kind of cemented our friendship right there. Uh, but the, the scat thing was, was kind of fun. I, I think I was, I was part of that group for about a year, maybe, maybe five or six issues. And it was great fun. Um, couple questions, a couple questions about that. Uh, did any of this, the scat guys uh, build careers in, in comics or cartooning that, that we would know? You know, that's a really good question. Um, there were several of the, the people who worked on stuff that, that were really quite good, uh, you know, good cartoonists. But I honestly can't recall if, if any of them, you know, made it big or even made it semi big, uh, you know, to the point where they could live with their, live uh, by the fruits of their cartooning. Sure. That, that might be interesting. You, you, your question kind of makes me want to do a little research on that. Um, that might answer the question, you know, <laughs> like if, if uh, the, the names don't, don't ring a bell. But, uh, but another question I had and was always curious about was uh, um, tell us about acquiring that, that Losers page. And uh, did you have any other original art? Because that would have been that time where shit, even when we were young, you would see in the back of like Kirby collectors and stuff, affordable Kirby pages, ethical Kirby pages from, from him and mm -hmm. Roz. Mm -hmm. uh, affordable but like in the 70s you know in the early 80s man that could have been some cheap stuff um i believe i got that losers page as well as a page from thor uh inked by Vin vinnie coletta um from a local comic book slash book dealer 
that I uh, knew and had actually worked for for a while. And I'd actually gone to a couple of New York comic conventions with him. Um, and yeah, I think, I think his name was Norman Witte and he had a bookstore called Omega Books uh, in Northampton for quite a few years. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought again. Did, did you have uh, any other artwork uh, that, you, that you purchased or like Kirby was your guy and, and you couldn't pass up the chance to get those, those Kirby pieces? Well, I definitely wanted the Kirby pieces because uh, uh, he, he's probably the biggest influence on my life in terms of uh, illustration and cartooning. Um, but I actually, <laughs> I, th I think if I remember correctly, I actually had an S. Clay Wilson original. Um, wow. and, and I stupidly traded it back to the guy I got it from for some other piece of art, which I can't remember, you know, <laughs> but I, I now I wish I'd, I had that Wilson original, uh, cause he's, he's such a unique person, unique talent. Was it his uh, app page or something? I, I wish I could remember. I, I, I don't, um, but it was, it was definitely him with all his quirks. Yeah. Peter, you mentioned going to a couple New York, uh, comic conventions. Mm -hmm. Were you making sample pages? Were you trying to become a comic book artist at that time? Uh, I decided that I wanted to become a comic book artist when I graduated from high school. And, and it really, um, it was the Kirby fourth world stuff that just pushed, pushed me over the edge because I was so blown away by what he was able to do with that. Um, it's just an outpouring of creativity that I'd never seen before in comics. Um, so I, I, I'd done a few little things on my own, um, trying to work up uh, some comic book ideas. I haven't seen them in years. I, I don't even know if I still have them. Um, Let's jump around a little bit, have some fun. Uh, did, 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 uh, did Jack Kirby ever see the Donatello issue? I'm happy to say that he did. And in fact, one of, one of my favorite memories from that period of time was um, we did that while we were living in Connecticut. Kevin and I were living in Connecticut. And I did the layouts for it and came up with basically the story and so forth. And we didn't want to do it without Kirby's OK, because yeah, you know he's a character in the, in the story. And I, it just so happened that we had gotten in touch with uh, Steve Bissett at that time. And he fortunately had Kirby's mailing address, which he gave to us. And I put together a package of uh, copies of all the layouts and the, the, the stories that we, you know, the notes on the side of the pages that I had written and basically told him that, you know, we'd like to do this story, um, publish this issue, split the profits with you half and half, and um, probably a couple of weeks after I had mailed that off, I was sitting in my house and I got a phone call and it's Jack Kirby, which completely flipped me out, you know, and, and I, I was just kind of shaking and, and stuttering and what, what have you. But he was really nice about it. And he said, yeah, sure. And, you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you want to do that story um, and have me be a character. And uh, don't, don't worry about the money. You, know, you keep the money. Um, but I, I do have one thing that I want you to change in the, in the, uh, in the story. And I, and I was like, sure, Mr. Kirby, anything. And he said, you know, uh, you, you, in, the, in the layouts that you sent me, you had me smoking a cigar. And I'd like you to take that out because I don't want the kids to think that's a good thing. You know, I, I've been smoking cigars and pipes for a long time and, and it was a big mistake on my part. And of course, you know, we, we were happy to do that. And uh, I believe we sent him multiple copies of the finished book uh, when it came out. That's amazing. So sweet. That's yeah, that's great. That's interesting. Uh, Jack Kirby recognizing the smoking as a bad thing and not to send that message out. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It speaks to the creative ownership, I think, that you would send him a letter of that nature, uh, you know, and, and trying to be equitable and, and say, you know, like he would get half and stuff like that. It's, it's one of the big things when I think about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and their impact 
um, on me, on generations of creators, is that creator ownership piece. That, that, that was something that was completely alien to me as a fan of Marvel Comics, you know, like most readers probably my age. You would just read Hulk and Spider-Man and X-Men and Batman and whatever and never really think about the idea that you could own a character. Mm. You got involved with with other self-publishers and other creator-owned, um, you know, proponents pretty early on. Uh, I think of like the creator Bill of Rights, um, mm. Dave Sim, you know, you mentioned Steve Bissett people that really champion that creator ownership, when does that become a big part of your life? I mean, obviously you own the Turtles from the beginning, but at some point, do you become like a champion of creator rights? Well, I think what was interesting in that regard was that um, we were no different than a lot of people who did their work and did their, their comics and, and kept ownership of it. Um, like you mentioned, Sim and... Uh, you know, we, we met the Peenies, Wendy and Richard Peeney, and, she, you know, they kept the ownership of ElfQuest. Uh, and it, at the time, I think also kind of going back a few steps, um, the undergrounds, uh, which Kevin and I were pretty much aware of at the time, um, these were clearly people who had their, their unique visions and they were publishing them, and, and they had not sold the, the rights to their their properties to anyone else. So it, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, now, if somebody had come to us and you know, around issue four or five and said, you know, we'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars for the rights to the turtles. We might've sat there and, and thought about it for a while. Um, actually, I have another story about that that I want to want to tell you. Um, but for, for us, it just seemed like uh, a no brainer you know, to, uh, that that we would, you know, we, we were we were doing okay in life and able to pay our bills. Sometimes it was a little hard, sometimes it was tricky. But you know, beyond the, the turtle comic, you know, we, before we, we did that, you know, we were able to make a make a go of it um, through whatever other jobs we had. You know, Kevin ended up working at a at a a, a hotel. Uh, at a lobster restaurant and some some other place I can't remember. And I had my illustration career where I was doing um, drawings through the mail for the local paper here in North Northampton and making a little money, not much. And, um, and again, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry, sorry. Uh, talking about creator ownership and, and, and the value of that and when you guys realized that you had, you know, you were champions of creator owned work. Yeah, uh, uh, no, I think I just remembered where I left, left off. Um, what, what I see in, in terms of the, the value of, of what happened with us is that very dramatically, people who were in the business, you know, on, on the independent side, it was, it was made clear to them very dramatically, you know, it's possible to have great success doing your own thing and, and keeping your own rights uh, to, to your material. Um, and I think that that actually happened even before the, the whole explosion of sort of merchandising and licensing happened. People were saying, oh my God, you know, the, the, these guys are putting out this black and white comic and they're printing, you know, 50,000, 60,000 copies of black and white. And if, if you knew anything about the economics of that, you knew that uh, we were making significant good money doing that stuff. And so I think that it really helped people to have that very clear and obvious and dramatic example that of what could happen with, with your, with your creator owned property. Were you aware of the black and white explosion then around you or were you too busy with the turtles to see it? We were quite busy, but we did take note of it. I mean, we, of course, like many people saw those uh, knockoff comics, you know, the radioactive black belt hamster and uh, preteen dirty jean kung fu kangaroo, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, you know, some of which we found amusing, 
And flattering to some degree, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery as the old saying goes. Um, and, you know, we, we did take note of, of the black and white explosion and I always felt a little bad about it um, because to a large extent, the, uh, what, what happened was there were a lot of comics put out that were fairly low quality and store owners were buying tons of them. And as you know, you know, if, if you look in the quarter bins and see all these comics that, that were published during that, in that time, you know that uh, a lot of them weren't meant to sell originally for a quarter. The, in fact, the, the book, the comic book shop owner may have paid much more than 25 cents for each copy. And that, that leads to a bad, a dark place, you know, where these stores really suffered from over, over enthusiasm and, and buying all these books that really were not going to sell. Um, and, and, it, and it did not work out for the, for the, the, the uh, good of a lot of uh, bookstore, comic book shop owners, unfortunately. One one of the things that's like really noteworthy uh, with you guys very early on, and certainly like the entire object of an issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, there was there was something to chew on every piece, from the editorials on the inside covers, to the letters pages, to to the occasional like pinups that would be in there. When you guys hit very early on, there there's so many different like levels of generosity that you guys sort of bring bring to comics it could be as simple as you guys shining some light on the interesting independent comics that were out at the time uh and and hipping people to you know flaming carrot or or whatever mm -hmm. uh there was certainly fan art that you guys would show in there and it, it would be like you know mark panacea fan art like like the guy became the ex editor at Marvel, you know, some years later, and you know he's got some of his first artwork in there. But then you guys would really extend yourselves and do strips for indie anthologies and things. Gary Groth, anything goes. Like that's probably that's the first Fantagraphics comic I ever bought on the strength mm -hmm. of a Turtles comic. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that was in that Shell Shock anthology. It's just Munden's Bar in the back of Grim Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, that that speaks a lot. That like foreshadows the generosity you guys bring forth later on. Kevin does Tundra, you do the Zurich thing, but it's clear you guys like established yourselves. We're doing quite okay, and w like what was that generosity about? I could I could make suppositions that it's like rising tide raises all ships, but from 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 your words, uh, like what was the what was the spirit there? Um, it might have had something to do with the fact that we started from a, uh, a fairly modest place. Um, and we knew how hard it was to get stuff out and to get into the public eye. And it just, it's, it just struck us that it wasn't that big a deal to add a couple more pages so we could have a few more pinups or talk about the comics we were enjoying reading at, at the time. Um, you know, it, it, it just seemed like the thing to do, uh, the right thing to do. You know, the biggest beneficiary of that, and he, and he, has, he has stated it, now he is an amazing cartoonist in his right, but probably the biggest beneficiary of that is, is Stan Sakai with Yusaki Yojimbo. Oh with uh, being published in Mirage, getting a lot of shine early, getting a figure. You hear about those WWF toys, Iron Sheet getting $80,000 royalty on that. So, yeah. so uh, and, he, and he says it in interviews a lot, like that uh, just, just for the people at home, that, that might be like one of the biggest examples of people who, you know, you, you, you goose a guy like that a little bit, it makes him makes it possible to pay his rent a little more and, and focus on the comic more and then get that train rolling for himself. Give him a, the rub. The rub, to use a wrestling talk. Yeah, it, it, it is a really uh, a, a good example of that giving back. Um, do you feel, Peter, were you and Kevin both just in love with comics at that time? You know, like as the Turtles are starting to succeed as a black and white book, are you, you know, 
interacting with comic shops, interacting with, um, I don't know, comics buyers guides, these kind of like fan areas. Was that a, was that a big part of that practice early on? Well, Kevin and I were definitely in love with comics at the time. You know, uh, we had a lot of energy to do the turtles and, you know, really a great desire to get our work out there. Uh, um, and, you know, we, we ended up doing a number of interviews with different comic book magazines. And, um, uh, you know, we, I think we fairly early on started going to conventions um, and doing signings at comic book stores. Uh, but yeah, we we love the the medium, and, and I think I've I've lost some of that more, probably more than Kevin has. Kevin still has quite a bit of jazz uh, for doing comics. Um, anything that, anything contribute to your loss? Uh, you know, of, of the love of the medium. Um, I, I don't I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, Maybe some of it is just getting older, um, generally having less energy than I used to have in general. Um, and maybe maybe a, a part of it is, uh, you know, as I think the saying goes, is seeing how the sausage is made. Um, you know, uh, going through it all and, and Sorry, we have a, a beep, beeper that goes off with the driveway. Somebody just goes up the driveway, and that's what that was. Um, what was I saying? Talking about kind of your feelings on the medium maybe decreasing. And, and I ask about it because, you know, we've read some of those interviews, lots of interviews, you know, with mm -hmm. you and Kevin Eastman. And from the outside, you look like it's a dream. You do a comic book together. It's just like a rocket ship of success. But as we dug into it, there's a little bit of a dark side to that, Absolutely. right? Like you don't have time to make the comics at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speak about that. Like like uh, the the business starts to take off and it just, it takes more of your time. Like emotionally, how, how was that to have to, you're so into comics, you're in, you know, you're making these things. But now the thing that, you know, you got into this whole thing to make comics. Now, now you like literally can't. Yeah, that was kind of tricky. Um, for a while, it was it was fine. Uh, the licensing was was kind of low key. We did a few things like the role playing book with Palladium and uh, the miniature metal figures with Dark Horse miniatures and some glow in the dark T shirts and button sets and. Stuff like that, and but it was only when the the real licensing stuff exploded that we ended up um, spending more time talking to lawyers and accountants and dealing with the the licensees and um, who who were producing product, uh, and not as much time drawing anything, which was which was troubling, uh, and I know that for, for both Kevin and myself. Uh, we were simultaneously happy about the success, but al also bummed out that we, we were no longer able to devote as much time as we had previously done to the writing and the drawing of the comics, um, which is why you see some big holes in the, in the publishing history at Mirage where we were not doing the comics. And... Um, yeah, it was hard. It was definitely hard. Uh, and uh, you, you could probably most fairly call it a mixed blessing. Um, you know, we were making quite a bit of money and that allowed us to do certain things that we otherwise would not have been able to do. Like, you know, Kevin starting Tundra and the Words and Pictures Museum, which was really all his thing. That was not me at all. Um, and I was able to start the Zero, Zero Foundation, but yeah, I mean, it's it was a it was a rough period. I remember, you know, getting exhausted going through contracts. Um, you know, coming into the, the office and seeing a foot high stack contracts uh, that I had to go through, 
And fortunately, we, we wised up after a while and, and got some good legal help and ended up you know, not having to do all that stuff. And, um, but at the same time, there, were, there was a, a, a whole slew of products that we wanted to be as, as, as much as we could be uh, uh, ca ca caring about the quality of the material. Uh, which, which meant looking at each thing, going through each step of the process, making sure that the way the turtles looked on the packaging was, was good. And, and it, it, just, it just became too much. And again, we, we managed to, after several years, find people to work that stuff for us. Um, but for a while, it was, it was really quite depressing, to be, to be honest. It's got to be nerve wracking coming to that place where uh, you're used to doing everything yourself. And now it's just a, you have to delegate uh, it, it like giving up that control has to be a bit nerve wracking. It definitely is. It definitely is. You, you want to find people who you can trust and, um, you know, had their own uh, intelligence that would allow them to, to do this work with, with without us looking over their shoulder. You know, another aspect of the turtles that, that had, like, how would you put that? that? That was basically extremely high quality uh, were, were stuff like the video games. You know, there was the arcade game, right. the four-player joint. There was the three NES games. There was Genesis, Super Nintendo. All good quality. Like, would, would you guys have any hand in that stuff? Because... it's They're exceptional for, for the platforms that they were on. Have you ever tried to beat the first one? I've never beaten any of the turtles' video games. They're tough, man. <laughs> they weren't yeah. baby-proofed. Looking back at that that whole period, it, it it it's kind of there's kind of melancholy that goes along with it, and I don't I don't dispute the the fact that it was nice having this kind of success and having the financial reward of of it. Um, but I, I often find myself kind of musing about the history of the, the property and, and how Kevin and I were tightly working on those issues for a while and then kind of had to pull away because we just didn't have the time or the energy. And I wonder sometimes what the Turtle Comics would have become if we had not done that. You know, if we had said, no, don't, don't, we're not going to license this. We're just going to work on the comics. And uh, I, don't, I have no idea what, what would have happened, but I, some, I sometimes think it, it would have been really cool to see where we would have gone with that. It, cross, it crosses my mind also, but, but in this reality that we live in, you guys solved it in a fantastic way by once again, I imagine, like, I don't know the business deal behind it, more of that generosity that I talked about earlier, where you would get a Mark Martin to pop in, or a Rich Rich Head and, and a Tom McQueenie, or a Michael Zoli. <laughs> that work was freaking dope. So how how would that process work? Did you meet these guys at comic conventions? Just strike up friendships? Some would, some of that, and the other times there would be people who would write in as fans and you know express interest in working on the turtles and. Um, some people we would meet at shows or at signings or what have you. Um, I, I honestly can't remember being too involved in that whole aspect of the publishing that we did. Um, I think Kevin is is a much more outgoing person than I am, and he he was significantly more involved in that. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I, w I wish I could remember exactly what, who did what back then, but um, I think I was, and I think Kevin was at the, at the time, just happy that people were willing to do those fill-in issues. Um, and it, it was interesting to see what people did, you know, what, what, what their takes on, on those characters would be. There's not another series like it. Mm -hmm. in, in like the history of comics, <laughs> where you kind of create this engine and then like let other people kind of do their deal mm -hmm. when you guys would publish stuff like gizmo and and uh some of the other stuff like would you have a lot of say in that it's a mirage comic oh not really i mean we did that 
um, comic that Jim Lawson created called Bait Biker. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Mike Dooney's Gizmo. Uh, Mike and I actually done, I think his first Gizmo issue before the Turtles were even published. Uh, mm -hmm. With a, some, I can't remember what the publisher was, but it was a small, small press thing. Um, but no, when people came to us with uh, books like that, that that we agreed to publish, our our our, our uh, ov oversight on them was very tiny because um, we trusted, especially people like Mike Dooney. You know, he's a, a tremendous talent, um, and we we were familiar with with what he did with Gizmo. And we're happy to have him be part of the Mirage, Mirage uh, group. Um, and it was great when, when Stan agreed, Stan Sakai agreed to let uh, Usagi and Jimbo pub, be published by Mirage. We were very proud of that. He, like you said, he's a great cartoonist um, and a good guy. And he's one of the best people we've ever met in the comics industry. Um, Peter, did you guys continue to maintain Mirage through the 90s? Like whenever that first volume of Turtles ends and we see like Turtles at Image Comics and Turtles at Archie Comic, is Mirage still like running at full capacity and, and, and doing other things then? Mirage, I believe during that period was maintaining the empire, if you will. You know, the uh, making sure that um, the... Uh, licensed products were all adequately protected and, and uh, you know were were done well as well as we could uh, get them to be done um but we definitely did slow down in terms of publishing for a while there um you know the, the i i i wish i had a, a, a an accurate chart of all these times and dates and issues but i remember um the Archie book uh, was something that kind of fit very neatly into the licensing program. Um, and when Steve Murphy took it over as writer, it became something even more interesting. Um, you know, he did a lot of really interesting stuff in that, in that series. I always wonder about that, that 90s because it's so big in comic books in the early 90s, but then pretty quickly becomes like, you know, at almost a death zone. Like we would see a lot of the self-publishers just disappear, you know, leave comics altogether as the mm -hmm. 90s get into the mid and late 90s and the distributors go away. And so I always wondered, like, if that was something you felt as, you know, as, as Mirage, if that was something you saw, like, comics bubble and then collapse. Well, like, like I said earlier, I think, you know, one of the mixed blessings of, uh, of our success was that you know, we showed that moderately talented people could put out a, a comic book and make good money selling it. And I think for some people that really worked and, and uh, the, the product that they produced was of good quality. But then you have the, the issue of a lot of the books that came out in the black and white explosion being just I mean, I, I find it hard to really describe them fairly, but I, I part of part of the, the the description is that I didn't really buy or keep many of them, um, and you you have a a, a a scenario set up where the, the the people selling comics in stores are over over ordering over buying. And then they end up with boxes and boxes and boxes full of books they can't sell for you know more than a quarter or a dime or whatever. Um, it it was a it was a curious period. I mean, it was it was. I, I kind of wish more talented people had taken the opportunity to jump in and really go crazy because I think it could have been really something. I mean, somebody like Steve Bissett, who is a good friend of mine. Um, I think he's he's a brilliant cartoonist, and if he had leaped in with both feet and really pushed his own work, you know, I think that he could have made a made a huge mark in the in the industry. 
Um, it was scary yeah. for those guys. They had to bet on themselves, you know. And and uh, when you get in those page rates and that that like reliable income, you know, that's that job mentality. Mm -hmm. Did you You're see right. Image Comics as an extension of what you guys were doing? Not really. Uh, Image always seemed to me um, sort of like a. Uh, uh, I don't know what, quite what the right word is here. Uh, a growth on Marvel Comics uh, that kind of budded off and became its own thing. Uh, you know, they they benefited hugely, I, I believe, from the promotional push that they got when they were still drawing for and writing for Marvel. Um, I don't really think without that promotional push, they would have made as made it a, as big a success of their company as they did. Yeah, no, not 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 at all. But uh, like when was it like Wildstorm that that had the turtles? Like I swear, like I'm, I'm trying to look here on Eric the Larson. Uh, w but wouldn't it say something like it was Eric Larson that got the turtles? Well, at Image, mm -hmm. at he Image. worked on them a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit. Jim Lee redesigned. No, the, that's what the, I'm talking. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, the, yeah. Like it would say, there was a turtles. It said Jim Lee's Ninja Turtles. Yeah, yeah. he made toys. Were, were you involved with that? Do you remember that? Well, <laughs> in the sense of, of approving uh, some of the the, the uh, packaging and artwork, um, you know, that was a, that was a thing. I think Playmates was was really excited about getting grabbing onto that bandwagon of images success at the time, um, and. I think they only did three turtles, and I, I think they left one out. Um, <laughs> one one thing I just I remember from that period that that there was a, if I'm remembering correctly, a, a kind of crossover comic book that featured the turtles and some of the image characters, like two two of the image characters, and going back and forth in the approval process of seeing that they all had equal space and weight on the on the front cover. So nobody got the better of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at something called Action Zone, and it, it's like all the uh, the uh, cartoon stuff. So like Wildcats was, was on and Turtles was on. And, and you see three equal dudes of equal size yeah. on that cover <laughs> right there. <laughs> That's what I was talking about. Peter, you know what? Like another, another dark side of... Uh, of this kind of success and it's documented well in, in interviews in, 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 in some ways is um, now anybody in your whole life who like m had a box turtle is like suing you and like saying that you guys have uh, like, like stole their idea. So that's certainly another component to yeah. the success that you guys d uh, didn't plan for. What was that right. like the first couple of uh, weird uh, lawsuits that came your way? It was very distressing, uh, and we hated it. And I still hate it. Uh, unfortunately, it's it no it's no longer happening. But I suppose it could someday. Um, but you know, it, some of the of it was uh, just ludicrous. Like there was one guy who claimed that he had been on a bus with one of us, and he had talked about the turtle idea that he had, and one of us stole it you know and it, it just became a, a, an ongoing distressing annoyance that was was not cheap to deal with both in, in emotional terms or in financial terms i mean we spent a lot of money on lawyers and, and uh lawsuits you know defending our our our, our, our defending ourselves i guess uh, in our property. And um, I'm so glad that I don't have to deal with that anymore. Um, it, it was it was a real drag. I mean, I, I can't really see any good aspect to it. It was just really annoying and frustrating. You know, it, it, not just because we had to pay a lot of money for lawyers to defend us, but because people were lying about what we did, you know, and blatantly lying. Um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm glad I don't deal with that anymore. When, when, uh, when you sell stuff, when you sell the turtles off to, to, to Viacom, obviously there's a financial part to it, but is there some relief 
in giving them that that burden as well? Yeah, it's definitely a passing of that torch. You know, that um, unless there's some tiny bit that none of the lawyers or professionals we employed to, or I employed to make sure that the deal was done correctly, if they missed something that I could be sued for, um, it's all gone from my, from my brain. Um, and, and I am very grateful for that. I mean, I think we, it took a long time and it took a lot of effort and took a lot of thought and, and the care but I think we ended up with a situation where it is, as you say, now their problem. You know, I, I have no idea if Viacom has been the subject of any lawsuits from people who, are, who claim that they invented the turtles. It's altogether possible that they have been, and I, I just don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that, for me anyway, it's over. Peter, did you view that as like the turtles were your business? Like, like you were an entrepreneur and you, you know, this was your business. And now as you would approach retirement age, you're selling your business. Is that how you viewed that? Essentially, um, I, I had had, close, I think, 25 years with the turtles um, and done a lot of different things with them and had a lot of ups and downs and back and forth. And I just didn't want to deal with it anymore and uh it it would have been i think significantly different if the partnership between kevin eastman and myself had remained what it was in the first few years but that had sort of fallen apart as well and uh i'm actually really grateful that kevin and i now have a really good relationship in fact i was just texting with him a couple of nights ago and uh, I, because I couldn't remember for the life of me, which one of us did the the red color overlay on this tr first cover. And uh, as it turned out, it, my 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 memory of it was actually correct that I I had done it, but I was not sure that if it had been me or Kevin. Um, but yeah, I mean the the, the twenty five years is, is quite a long time, and uh, I think I. I was experiencing a certain amount of burnout, you know, that uh, I just, I just didn't need it anymore. And, um, you know, it, it was, it had been a great thing in my life, but it had also been a source of great stress. Um, you know, and I sometimes feel like when I talk about this area of the, the whole history that I, 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 I'm kind of uncomfortable saying it because it sounds like I'm, I'm whining, um, but I do appreciate the, the, the plus, the positives that the turtles have brought me over the years, but it also did have a stark side. You know, there's no question about it. It's, it's man, there's a lot of great stuff there. I'm, I'm so happy to hear you and Kevin Eastman are on good terms. You know, that, that makes me feel good in my heart because in, in my imagination, you know, you guys are these just anonymous B biggest influence, such a big influence it's hard to even you know put it in scale so that mm. makes me feel good the other part is I i'm glad that you get to do this on your terms you know i often look at the turtles as this ideal you know as a creator you, you want to have this control and for you to be able to have a career and decide you're ready to sell this um it's it's the whole reason that creator ownership is so important, you know, because it is up to you. It's your creation. You should do whatever you want with it. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear you talk about that in the way that you that you did. And depending on one of the documentaries, either the Toys That Made Us episode or the Turtle Power documentary, uh, you mentioned that you have something in there that at any some clause at any po any point you could you could self publish a Turtles comic. So you could you kept you kept that piece open. I think a lot of the audience is real curious. You know, there was a volume four of, of Turtles that came out in the aughts. Mm -hmm. uh, will that ever be collected? Um, can you can you uh, expand or elaborate on that little clause? Because uh, like that's the hopeful little clause that there might be 
some future Peter Laird comics or whatever, but just uh, expand on that a little bit. Sure. Um, basically, when uh, it took about two years between the time that the idea of selling the turtle property was first brought up seriously until we actually had constructed the deal and, and it went through and, and I sold the property. Um, but during all that time, I, I had this really strong feeling that there might come a day when I would just do a turtle comic because I wanted to get back with the guys, you know, and, and have some fun like we did back, back way back when. And the idea that I might not be able to do, legally do that ever again was really annoying to me. It was really kind of obnoxious. And so that's one of the things I instructed my attorney to work into the deal. Um, and it, it was, it, it seemed like kind of a no brainer for the, for Viacom because what, what would have hurt them to give me that right? You know, and I think they, they eventually realized that and they were open to, to uh, putting that in the, in the purchase and sale agreement. Um, and th there, there have been many times in my life when doing a turtle comic just gave, brought me so much joy and, 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 and fondness that I really didn't want to lose that. Um, and who can say whether I'm actually going to use that clause? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, it's possible that I might if, if Jim, will, Jim Lawson is willing, finish volume four. I have some ideas about how to do that. I haven't really put them into play yet, um, but I would kind of like to do that. And then it would be cool to, to see a collection of it, like you mentioned. Um, I actually have given some amount of thought, although not, not tremendous amounts, but some about how fun it might be for some sometime in the hopefully near future to get together with Kevin and say, let's do a turtle comic together and see what happens. You know, see what we can come up with that might be interesting and, and fun for the two of us to, to actually do, to go back to the old days. And, you know, it, it'll be difficult because he lives in San Diego now and we don't share a house. And, um, you know, we can't pass pages back and forth like we used to. Uh, but I, I've often thought it would be really fun to see what, what, what would come out of our brains after all this stuff has happened, all the toys, all the animated series, all the movies and the, uh, you know, everything else. You know, what, what could we do that would be interesting and fun? Uh, and, you know, it might happen. I think he, he's, uh, like I said, you know, we, we've been on good terms for quite a while now. And um, he actually mentioned that he... Um, he saw Stan Sakai recently and Stan wants him to do a, a cover for a book he's doing. And Kevin suggested that I might be interested in inking that. And I said, yeah, I think I would. So that might be happening. Um, it, who knows? You, know, you never know what's going to happen. It would be, I think, a, a great enjoyment for me to do that again with Kevin. Because that collaboration was the best I've ever had. My my one my collaboration with Jim Lawson on the Planet Races book was close, but the turtle thing with Kevin was really special, and uh, I I would I would think I would really enjoy seeing some of that again, going through it again. You know, with the with the benefits of technology, uh, you know, you it might not be physical pages that you could uh, send back and forth, but with email and and, and Zoom calls and stuff mm -hmm. like you like, you, we've never been closer. You know, like we we interview people in Great Britain. On, mm -hmm. on this thing and, and it really it really shrinks the the world and makes it possible to uh to to have those kinds of collaborations and to and to do cool stuff uh that's just me uh trying to yes add, still put a little <laughs> gas a little gas on the fire that's us yeah, just agreeing with you peter <laughs> <laughs> but you know uh talk about like the you know the, the purchase agreement all that stuff another great piece to the turtles dynasty that that peter and kevin put together is just having so much creative control and personal input in all the products, having this, the say and stuff nowadays in a world where people are, they're trying to run up to Netflix to, to get a $30,000 check 
to give them a hundred percent of everything, mm-hmm. uh, to still have that creative ownership, that creative control, that's a lesson. And and to know that if you reach something at like a at a high level, that you, you could still get a little something put into a contract. It reminds me we uh, we talked with uh, Jeff Smith years ago. We had a different mm-hmm. kind of podcast that was just audio based. And uh, Jeff Smith has those like Bibles of the bone. It's like a, you know, 1500 page comic. Uh, He has the deal with Scholastic also. And uh, with that deal, he told them like, you know, I, I'm a Tolkien guy. Like, like I want to have my big thick comic. Is that okay if I still publish the thick black and white comic? They were like, I don't know. Like, like what, what kind of numbers are you, you, you doing on those, uh, those thick Bibles? And he's like, got about 250,000 out there right now. And they were like, pshh keep it <laughs> yeah go ahead so like it makes sense you know viacom they're playing for big crazy they're playing for billions mm-hmm. so they're gonna like yeah let you let you do your thing i do want to talk about some of the ups some of the good lots stuff. of the ups yes. man. we gotta have some xeric talk about that's this exactly pitch. where i'm going because the xeric was something that i responded to as an aspiring creator yeah, and same. as a reader I would see, you know, the new crop of Zurich Award winners. And for anybody that doesn't know, the Zurich Foundation, Peter starts in the early 90s to give uh, small grants to self-publishers. A couple so, times a year. Two times yeah, a year. two times a year. So it ran for 20 years. Yes. There were 40 rounds of these grants, and I had five or six cartoonists maybe at a clip. Hundreds of books published yeah. as a result. And I would use those as like... You know, I would see Zurich, who, who, what books are coming out from Zurich Award winners, and I'd try to track them down. It was almost like this stamp of, like, something interesting is here. Yeah. Um, so, Peter, first of all, thank you for enabling a lot of interesting comics to come out that way. Uh, what was your experience behind the Zurich Foundation? Well, it actually started... Um, <laughs> there was one incident that really kicked it off. Um, uh, I, I was... Uh, I can't remember if I was walking or riding my bicycle, but I ran into somebody in the town where I live, who I didn't know, who stopped me and said, I know who you are. Could you loan me $250,000 so I can open up a general store? And, you know, I, I, I found that kind of thing just mind blowing. Uh, and really realized that at that point, I needed a, a way to say, don't talk to me, apply over here. Um, and you know, if, if, if you apply and your, the quality of your application is such and such, you might get that grant. Um, and I have a, a couple of really smart people helping me devise the, the nuts and bolts of it. But it really came about as a way for me to avoid the emotional trauma of having to tell people, no, I'm not going to give you money, you know, because I wanted to give some people money. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot of uh, organizations and people who re- can really legitimately use funds like that for good purposes. So the um, this foundation and, and the word Zurich is a word I, I, I enjoy just because it sounds cool. It actually came about in a Scrabble game with my late brother, Don, the one I did the calendar of the gods with. Um, and I think it was a word that I just kind of made up, hoping desperately that it would turn out to be a real word. It's a valuable Scrabble word. That, that, <laughs> yeah, putting, putting, that, putting that X to use. <laughs> yeah. and, and in fact, it did. It means dry or desert life. Um, anyway, uh, the, the grant, um, the, the foundation was set up from the beginning to do the comic book grants. 50% of the money for comic book self-publishers and 50% for um, charities. Um, and there were two different groups of people doing the, the evaluations of the, the grant applications. I wish I could tell, tell you their names because it'd be interesting for you, but they've, they've never given me permission to do that, which is fine. I mean, they wanted anonymity. Um, but it worked out fantastically well. Uh, and I, it, it may be the thing I'm most proud of coming out of this whole turtle experience. Um, did either of you ever apply? I was so chicken <laughs> to do so. And, and it's sort of, um, I, was, I was young, like I was too young. Uh, 
Tom Shuley, who pops on the channel, he got one in 1999. I was, I was still, you know, I had two years of high school left to go uh, mm. at, at, at that point. And I looked up to all the Zurich winners and was just like, it's hopeless. I always had the idea of like, I'm going to apply, I'm going to do it. But then I'm like, no, cold feet always. Uh, and just never pulled the trigger. I, I, I applied and uh, and I was rejected, Peter. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, now he wants the name of those dudes, man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll have their home, home address as well. I'd like to send them a little note. We, we probably shot and interviewed a couple of them, I, I would bet. But, but yeah, you know what? I find the application process to even be valuable. Just that mapping out a plan, getting mm. quotes for like, you know, printing costs. I always think that's a valuable piece. And, and I kind of looked at it that way it because I did end up self-publishing, you know, so it, it was a very good experience for me, even though I did not uh, make it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's more like it gauges the, the seriousness of, of the creator. Uh, we, interviewed uh david cho he's he's the guy who did the the raphael episode right. uh, with us he he got a he got a zurich for for slow mm -hmm. jams and he talked about how like you got i i guess at least at the time you guys like the check you would cut it to the um the, like the printing plant just so that these dudes can't go crazy with this looter or whatever the fuck. uh but but he's like to you guys like I'm just not that guy. Like, I, I don't quite, he has the skills, you know, he puts, the, has the facility, but he just like that part. He's like, just give me the loot. Like I'll, I'll, I promise I'll print it. I won't waste it on anything. But he said that that was like a conversation that he had to have uh, mm -hmm. back and forth with you, you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As it turned out, um, the application process process was just hard enough to separate the wheat from the chaff. You know the the real serious people from those who are just kind of having doing a little fun thing. Um, and it's, I'm sorry you didn't get the grant. <laughs> it's quite all right, <laughs> but it, uh, it, but it is that that part that like okay like this is a serious thing. It's not just a vanity thing, and you have to have some administrative ability in case if it pops off. Like if if you have success with this thing, like you have to have some administrative chops. To just uh, weather that storm with all the stuff that we laid out in this past hour of suing and just logistics of making print stuff happen, like you gotta, you gotta have have those ducks in a row. Yeah. And I always loved the idea, you know, like reading interviews or whatever, that it it, it was very similar to what you guys did with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one. Uh, that being a loan that you got from from Kevin's uncle, you know, to print, but. Right. Uh, the similar idea, you know, it was like something you were helping creators with in terms of like, here's a, here's, here's the step we took. Here's a, you know, here's the first, let me help you on your first steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was uh, exactly that. I mean, it, the loan that, that Kevin's uncle gave us was really meaningful in the history of our, our self-publishing. Uh, I, you know, I, I've often looked at that, that his part of our history and, you know, it's, it's very likely that we would have eventually saved up the money, got enough together to pull, pay the printer, but it would have taken months, maybe years. And who knows what it would have happened with the, with the property, uh, if we had to wait that long to get the first issue out. Uh, so I, I have, I've always been grateful to Kevin's uncle for that. And, and and let's talk about that because it kind of it kind of parrots the 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 Zurich application process. It's not like it's not like Kevin just went up to Uncle Quentin and was like, "Can I get seven hundred dollars?" Like you guys presented this material. Well, like like how did that work? If I'm remembering correctly, we had we had either finished all the work that we needed to do on the book and made a dummy copy that we were able to show him. This is exactly what we're doing. This is how we want it to look. Um, I think we did that and basically explained to him what our what our hopes were, you know, the, to uh, pay for as many copies as we could reasonably afford with his loan and the money that we had saved up already, and hope for the best. Because at that time, I mean, that that was a period when, and I know I've said this before. I may have even said it to you guys and today. We. <laughs> We had this huge stack of, of boxes of the first issue, first printing. And we 
would sometimes somewhat facetiously say, we're going to be burning these, these this winter <laughs> to stay warm. Uh, because we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, it, it could have gone anyway. We Fortunately, it went the way it did. And, you know, that big stack of boxes was gone in, I think, a week and a half. Um, so on top of putting that business plan together and everything, uh, you guys did like some put together like press kits and put that stuff out there. And that certainly could not have hurt. Oh, no, it didn't. And in, in fact, um, I look at the early days with and think of several things that really helped happen what happened. Um, I actually did most of the work on putting that press kit together, which included, I think, three pages of artwork um, and a, a single page of typewritten material, basically telling what the story was about and what we were trying to do and so forth. And and I may have mentioned this to you when I talked to you the other day. Um, I went to the d local Dover, New Hampshire Public Library and found a really great book that listed all um, media sources. I think it was in the, in the main New Hampshire and Vermont. And I was able to extract from that book, I don't know how many addresses. I think we ended up sending out, I, I may be wrong about this, but I think we sent out 180 press kits. Um, and one of them went to United Press International, UPI. I don't think they're in, in business anymore. But at the time, they were like AP. They, they basically went all over the world, you know, with uh, newspaper stories. And, and within a couple of weeks of sending them that, that press kit, they called up. They sent a reporter and a photographer up to Dover, New Hampshire, at to our house. And the reporter wrote a story. The photographer took pictures. And that freaking thing went all over the place. It was it was mind boggling. You know, we we would never even be, been able to reach the m amount of money that would have, would have been necessary to pay for that kind of publicity. And we got clippings from all over the country and internationally too, from people sending who've seen this thing. That was one thing that that kind of like nudged the door open. But the other thing was, and I and I I feel this to the bottom of my heart. The name was the savior of our property because it's so goofy and so strange that you can't help but do a double take when you hear it. See what? Teenage Mutant? What? And uh, it, it, I think it made a huge difference. It, it, even if you kept the same words but rearranged them, Teenage Ninja Turtle Mutants, just isn't the same thing. It, 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 it was a... Uh, I hesitate to say we, we had any kind of genius in doing that, but it really worked out well. Yeah, the thing is, like, when you when you remember as a kid, you diagram sentences, like, when you break it down, it's iambic. It's like the stuff that poets try to manipulate language to try to get that exact cadence and the flow and, like, harsh syllable, soft syllable, harsh, soft. It's a, it's a I am, you know, soft, hard, actually. Mm -hmm. And Teenage Mutant Ninja, like like the song makes itself with, just with the title. Uh -huh. it's, so it has that natural flow that Shakespeare wanted, which is, which I'm, uh, you're a very smart guy. I don't know that you were thinking about Shakespeare when you were coming up with the uh -huh. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle title, but that it is, it's the best title in comics. Yeah. Like in terms of like just headspace and like what that conjures in your mind, like what's the second best title in Bone. comics? <laughs> oh amazing amazing all these little bits to create that 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 wild success man you got anything else man because i have four million things but we got to let peter go peter are you still drawing today like how do you occupy your 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 time now that you're you're retired i watch a lot of youtube videos <laughs> We, we appreciate that. We have a Turtles playlist. We'll eventually get to every issue, I'm sure. 
I hope you do. I, I find that your your approach to uh, looking at them very interesting. I have my three issues of the river right over there that that I've been planning to to pull to uh, check out some uh, some Rick Veach mm-hmm. TMNT sooner than later. But as far as what I what kind of drawing I've been doing is very very little. Um, a few months ago, I I sat down and drew a, a bunch of turtle head sketches, um, and also some some turtle full body sketches that I uh, offered to my friend Steve Levine uh, to take with him to the shows he was going to and sell and, and split the process proceeds for for them. Um, but I haven't really done anything significant. Um, I've inked a couple of things that Kevin penciled. And I actually inked a couple of things that Steve Levine penciled. But I just haven't had the, the real impetus to uh, do much else. Um, I, I wish I did. I mean, I, I used to be the, one of those guys who carried a sketchbook around with them all the time and drew in it religiously. But I haven't been that way for years. Um, I, I would like that to change, actually. But I think I think the whole turtle thing affected me differently than it did Kevin. I think Kevin was able to retain a lot of his his uh, creative energy that I have not been able to. But you never know. I might get back to it. Do you still have some some long boxes and stuff of uh, you know, but your Kirby runs or do you, what are some prize comics that you revisit? Um, I actually have my my wife suggested this, believe it or not, that I in our living room, which is over that way, um, I put together a bookshelf full of my Kirby reprint volumes. So I now have this bookshelf that's about this tall, about that wide, that's all filled with Kirby stuff, which is fun to look at. I, I still admire that guy so much. Um, I don't, I, I think I have out, out in the barn in my, my studio, um, I have some individual comics. I, I think I saved my Conan comics that Barry Smith threw and all the uh, fourth world stuff that Kirby did. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't think I have any boxes of comics. Oh, actually, I have boxes of turtle comics. Does that count? <laughs> yeah, you must, right? Yeah. And, and actually, I, I, I think I got rid of about half of them a few years back when, when I wanted to trim down the collection in the barn and uh, sell, a, sell a bunch off at the, through the Mirage uh, website. A lot of people looking for those City at Wars, man. <laughs> they're, they're going for a high price these days. Do you have a set of all of the Zurich winners? I do not. I realized that there were so many that it would be hard to find a place for them. All different sizes too. That's a, that's be... a challenge of the uh, when you go to SPX or something and you have yes. just like comics this big, comics that big. Um, it would be such an amazing exhibit to see yeah. the the you know the rewards of that because it tracks so much development in comics. And mm. you know when we were talking about the kind of the positive and the ups of some of the turtle stuff, I think about the Zurich Foundation and I think about Tundra. Yeah, you know both you and Kevin, you know you you you, you strike with the turtles and you're doing well and both of you are very generous in giving back a lot of resources to the uh to the comics community um it's interesting tundra it's almost like here's money for professionals and the xeric is almost like here's money for for people starting up for for new creators mm. it's really remarkable except all the t- ex- all the xeric books came out that's true <laughs> <laughs> Oh, snap <laughs> that was me that was not peter uh peter thanks so much man uh jimmy do you have anything else no this has been a a delight i, I really appreciate your time and, and thank you so much for uh for everything you've done peter it's it's, it's been great well i i appreciate your interest and uh it, this has been a lot of fun for me too we really pre- appreciate you reaching out uh, because the getting a chance to talk to you first off like just for pleasure whenever i'm drawing like i like to pull up interviews with cartoonists and things and and there's very little peter laird conversation on youtube at conventions or anything so so like we're so thankful to have this chance but we wanted to interview you you know week one of having this channel uh yeah. there was no vector to get to you so the fact that you hit us up independently and created this opportunity 
Mm-hmm. Dream, dream come true. Thank, thank you so much, Peter. You're, you're really welcome, guys. Hope to do it again sometime, man. Maybe crack open that Cerebus 8 I have over there that we've been meaning to do an episode on. And uh, if you want to come back, please join us and let's let's go through these yeah. comics. Yeah, I can do that. Awesome. Uh, take care, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.